brings us a worship this morning. We're glad that you're here with us. What do you believe in the Lord for this morning? What blessing are you seeking him for this morning? You know, the Bible says in Matthew 5, verse 6, familiar verse from the Beatitudes, blessed are those who do what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. How many know if we come with that kind of heart attitude to church, we're going to be blessed. The blessings don't perceive the hunger and the thirst for righteousness. God just doesn't bless us because we're worthy, right? He blesses us because of true righteousness, which we know only comes because of Jesus. Amen. So the blessing that you're seeking him for this morning, it's available to you, but it's only through faith in his son. Amen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That has to precede the blessing. And who will hunger and thirst for all that he has for us, his righteousness, his holiness. God doesn't give us blessings or, yeah, give us blessings and promises and treasures without holiness. Amen. Otherwise, we, we squander the opportunities. And then later, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says again, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, making his priority your priority first. Then what will happen? All these other things will be added unto you. So God wants to bless you. He's a blessing God this morning. And we're going to be blessed just to be in his presence. But let's let righteousness and holiness, Christ's righteousness, be our heart's desire this morning. Amen. That we can become a little bit more like him. And God the Father can't help but bless his son. Amen. And so if we have faith in his son, we can have the need that we're believing him for this morning. Amen. Do you believe that? Some of you, I think, are still waking up. But I think you'll get it. So let's, let's believe the Lord for his presence this morning. And just welcome his presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the privilege that we have to come into your presence. God, help us not to take it lightly. Lord, would we enter into your throne room in praise and worship. God, let us realize this morning how holy, how awesome, how limitless you are. God, I pray that we'll have a desire, a hunger, and a thirst for righteousness. God, that our hearts can be changed from sin, from from our own selfish ambition. And God, that our hearts can be changed to be a little bit more like you this morning, Jesus. Lord, we're hungry and thirsty for what you want, what you desire for our lives. Lord, we know that as we praise and as we worship you, Lord, you're going to bless us. You're going to meet our needs. You're going to provide for us because your word promises that today. And Lord, I just pray that we can worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. And Lord, that our hearts will be fertile soil for the seed of the word of God to fall on today. Let there be a hundredfold harvest in each heart. God, your uh, evidence, Lord God, that you're doing something powerful, something eternal in our lives today. Lord, we'll give you the praise. We'll give you the honor for all that's accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh 
Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you because of the cross. Lord, we thank you for that great sacrifice, Lord, that you made for us there. It's because your blood was spilled out in our place. Lord, that we can be righteous, that we can be holy, Lord, that our lives can be different, God. We don't have to be bound in sin. We don't have to be lost and wandering anymore, Lord Jesus. We can live in light. We can live in the glory of your presence, hallelujah, because of your forgiveness, because of what you purchased with your precious blood, hallelujah. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you for all that you've done for us at Calvary, hallelujah. We worship you, Lord, hallelujah. Change my heart, oh God.
Hallelujah. Lord, we want to become a little bit more like you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Strip away the flesh, God. Strip away those things, God, that don't honor you, God, that don't lift you up in our lives. Hallelujah. And Lord, do a work in us, Lord.
Holiness comes before the blessing. Amen. If you'll say, God, I want my heart to be like yours. God says, I want to meet your need. I'm going to bring the healing that you're believing me for. Amen. I'm going to bring the provision financially that you are carrying that load this morning. So let's sing this chorus one more time. And if you have a need, I just want to encourage you to lift your hands and give it to God. Say, God, you're big enough. Amen. God, you're still the all-sufficient one. God, you're still holy. You're still righteous. And Lord, you want to bless me with good things. Amen. He responds to faith. Amen. Not, not presumption. Amen. Thinking that God owes you something. God doesn't owe us anything. But when we worship him in faith because of Jesus, he's going to meet that need. So let's sing that chorus one more time. Hallelujah. You're keeping, enabling, sanctifying grace. Lord, and I'm thankful this morning that your grace is greater than all of our sin. Hallelujah. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And Lord, we need that moving, that operation of your Holy Spirit in our lives today. God, we don't rest on the victories of the past. God, we need you today, Jesus. Lord, for those situations that your people are carrying upon their hearts this morning, God, I pray for a breakthrough. I got, God, I pray for answers to prayer, Lord Jesus. I pray for healing, Lord God. I pray for peace of mind. I pray for provision. And Lord, we know that all those things are available to us in your presence, Lord God. In your presence is everything that we have need of. God, we believe you for answers today. God, we believe you for a remedy, for relief. God, we just thank you. We praise you for what you're going to do. We thank you for what you are doing, Lord God, in our lives. Lord, let us be sensitive to your spirit in this service this morning. Let us hear, Lord, what you want to speak to us in the remainder of this service. Have your way, God. Help us to want and to desire what you want. Lord God, as your word uh, gets in our heart this morning, we just give you praise. We give you the remainder of this service. Have your way in each heart, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Bibles, go ahead and grab them this morning. Turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. I want to share a message entitled this morning, The Dark Stain of Sin. The Dark Stain of Sin. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 is our main text, and we'll read that in just a moment. You know what man's number one problem? What is it? You'll hear all kinds of things on TV, won't you? Advertising, marketing, Man's number one problem. If you buy our razors, right? If you buy our hair products, if you buy our makeup, if you go to our restaurant, it'll solve all your problems, right? Man's number one problem. What is it? It's not low self-esteem. 
That's what a lot of people are telling everybody. Always, if we just understood who we really are, and I think there's some truth in that, who we are in Christ, amen? But it's not about low self-esteem. That's not man's number one problem. It's not too many taxes. If you turn on the cable news, you know, that's what you'll hear, that our problem is we've got too many taxes. It's not poverty or a lack of material possessions. That's not man's number one problem. It's not the, that the wrong party is in political office, although you hear a lot of that as well. Man's number one problem is what? Sin. Amen? What we're going to preach about this morning, what we hear preached about very little in the modern church. But man's number one problem is sin. Sin has left a dark stain upon the heart of mankind and no amount of self-determination, no amount of good deeds, no amount of willpower can rid the human heart of that dark stain of sin. And I want to talk about that this morning. Listen to this story, and then we're going to get into our text this morning. A flippant youth asked a preacher, You say that unsaved people carry a weight of sin. I feel nothing. How heavy is sin? Is it 10 pounds? 80 pounds? The preacher replied by asking the youth, If you laid a 400-pound weight on a corpse, would it feel the load? The youth replied, it would feel nothing because it is dead. The preacher concluded that spirit too is dead, which feels no load of sin or is indifferent to its burden and flippant about its presence. And the youth was silenced. Amen? Sin is deadly. Sin has a weight upon our spirit. It may not weigh 10 pounds or 80 pounds or be able to be quantified in that way. But it will crush our lives if we don't understand what this book says about sin. Amen. And so the Lord wants us to see some things this morning. The dark stain of sin, whether it's willful sin, whether it's a sin of ignorance or a sin of omission, it must not be left unconfessed. Amen. Sometimes we do things that we know exactly. The Bible says we shouldn't be doing it. That's willful sin, right? There's different types of sin. They're all three deadly. But the Bible talks about willful sin. You know some verses that you could quote, yet you still do what the Bible says you ought not to do. That's willful sin. And we as believers, even though we don't want to admit it because we want to keep this image, right, of, of re religion, of looking religious, that's self-righteousness. But we, even as believers, we commit willful sin at times. And that's why we need God's grace. That's why we need, as we say this morning, God to create a clean heart within us because of acts of sin. There's sins of ignorance where we just don't know any better. We do th things that are not representing God's holiness appropriately, but we didn't know any better. But what happens when the Holy Spirit makes it known in our hearts? We better deal with it because the weight of sin is heavy. It's deadly. And then sins of omission. We'll talk about this some more, but James 4.17 says, To him who knows to do good, and does not do it, what? To him it is sin. So it's not just what you don't do. I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't chew, I don't hang around with people who do. But sometimes there's some things that you ought to be doing that you're not. Sins of omission. Things that God's called you to be doing as his child. And those things are sin as well. And if those things are left unconfessed, we must recognize that its deadliness does not just pertain to our physical lives. Amen? It will have an effect on your physical life. Sometimes we're sick because of unconfessed sin in our lives. Not every time that we're sick, as some preachers will try and tell you. But there's a lot of times that we're physically sick because of sin that is unconfessed in our lives, even as believers. But it also has an emotional effect, doesn't it? How often is our mind not where it needs to be because we've allowed dirty things into the well of our heart, into the well of our spirit? You can't expect, as an illustration, when I was a kid, I heard in youth many times, you can't expect to draw out clean water of a well that you've been throwing trash into, can you? Most of our kids today have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> in a well. They get water from Colorado Springs Utilities, and there's no, you know, not much chance of impurities. But you used to have to put a bucket down, right? Draw up some water from underneath the ground to get clean water to drink. If you throw trash in there, you can't expect to get clean water. But it also affects us spiritually. Spiritually is probably the most significant. Sin has a deadly effect. And if we don't repent of it at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, we're going to have the weight of sin crush us. 
And that dark stain of sin will not be removed if we don't go by God's way of redemption, amen, by God's way of cleansing. So I want to talk about that this morning. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, are you there? It says this, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Most of us have heard that passage before. But the Lord wants to speak to us, I believe, in this just this one short verse about the dark stain of sin. And I want us to look at three realities concerning the dark stain of sin. Three realities that we can see in this verse. Number one, you must come and reason with the Lord. If you want your sins to be dealt with, if you want a remedy for your sins, Dr. Phil can't take care of it, can he? Oprah Winfrey, even though she doesn't have a main show anymore, she still has her cable channel. She can't deal with your sin. There's no one that is an earthly human being that can deal with your sin. You must come and reason with the Lord if your sins are going to be dealt with. There's no priest that can absolve you of your sins, even though they tell you they can't. Amen. There's no amount of good deeds or programs that you can get involved with in the church that will make you good enough to offset the bad things that you've done in your life. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of churches today are, are maybe not verbally saying that. They're implying that. Well, if you're in enough small groups, if you're involved in enough ministries, do enough good things of service, give water bottles and blankets and help people enough, you can offset the bad deeds. No, you can never. You, you can never offset the sin in your life. You must come and reason with the Lord. There is absolutely no other remedy for removing the dark stain of sin from your heart and life but the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? We better believe that this morning. That's what Isaiah 118 is telling us. Come and reason with the Lord. As we sang this morning, what can wash away my sin? Nothing. Do we believe that? Or are we just singing it because it was words on a screen? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole? Again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. The only remedy for sin, the only thing that can atone and make right and bring us back into harmony with God because of our sins is the blood of Jesus. Amen. It's still true today. And we need to hold on to that. The verse says, you must come to the Lord and come now. Do you see that? Isaiah 118. Doesn't say come when it's convenient or come you know, when all the circumstances are just right, it says, come now, don't waste any time. If you've got the weight of sin and it's affecting your emotions, it's affecting your physical body, it's affecting your spirit, you better come as quickly as you can and get in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And reason with the Lord who holds the remedy for sin. Otherwise, you're in a very deadly situation. Come now. If your doctor ordered an MRI for you, think about this. When he got the results, he could see that cancer was present in your colon. He wouldn't say, okay, it appears your MRI uh, show, it shows that you have a cancerous tumor in your colon. Let's make an appointment with the front desk, desk for this time next year. We'll take another look at it. You, if he said that, he'd be going, what? Right? Because we know cancer is deadly. If you ignore cancer, what's going to happen? It's just going to spread. It's just going to get worse. It doesn't get better on its own. Now, sometimes the Lord heals. Amen. And he does a miracle and praise God for that. But you'd be a fool if your doctor told you that your MRI showed you had a cancerous tumor in your colon. And he said, let's make an appointment for next year at this time. You may not be there next year at this time. But you know what? That's what a lot of people are doing regarding their sin. They're just putting it off. Well, I'll deal with it later. I'm having too much fun. And the Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. Amen? For a season. Our response to the dark stain of sin must be the same with the same urgency that we have regarding cancer or something of that magnitude in our physical life. We must deal with it once the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. Now, God doesn't hold us accountable if we're not aware of our sin. But that's why we need to be in church. Amen. That's why we need to be reading this book on our own and spending time in prayer so that we're sure that our life is pleasing to the Lord. Amen. That there is no opportunity for sin. There's no opportunity for the devil to have a foothold in our lives. But once the Holy Spirit responds, shows us, and what is conviction? It's the Holy Spirit saying, Eric, there's something in your life that doesn't please the Lord. Eric, there's something in your life that's contrary to my holy word. 
And then once we receive that, we have to respond. Amen? Otherwise, we're, we're a fool. We're, we're like that cancer patient ignoring the cancer that's in their colon. We've got to respond immediately. Stop justifying your sin, God tells us this morning. Stop making excuses for your sin. Stop comparing. This is what we all do, isn't it? Stop comparing the severity of your sin in your eyes with the sin of others around you. Well, at least I'm not doing what Miss Wendy is doing. You ought to hear what she has in her life, right? Isn't that what we do? We try and minimize our sin by comparing it with everybody else's. Where the Bible says, Romans 3.23, we all can probably quote it, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're foolish to compare. Well, my cancer is not as big as Dave's cancer, so I'm just going to put it off for, for a year. Right? We would never say that. That would be foolish. But that's what we do with our sin. Stop justifying it. Stop making excuses. Stop comparing it with the sin of others around you. It's still a dark stain of sin that must be dealt with. Look at this picture. Many of you have seen this before. Brother Swigert says this quite often. Sin takes you where you don't want to go. It takes you further than you want to go. Sin keeps you longer than you want to stay. And sin costs you more than you want to pay. It's packaged beautifully, isn't it? It's attractive. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a temptation. But sin will take you where you don't want to go, further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it costs you more than you want to pay. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually, the weight of sin is deadly. And it says at the bottom, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. We better remember that as we consider the dark stain of sin this morning. Too many people are living in denial as it regards the dark stain of sin in their lives. Don't put it off any longer. Come now to the Lord Jesus Christ by way of the cross and trust the only remedy for, for cleansing the dark stain of sin from your life. And that remedy is Jesus, amen, and his finished work. What he accomplished at Calvary has nothing to do with your works. All you have to do is repent and believe and receive, amen? Easy stuff. But Jesus went through what he went through to make it that easy for you. His work is what matters. Listen to this quote or the, this uh, definition. The word reason in verse 18, it means this, to demonstrate what is right and true, proving or proof. God says, come, let us reason together. Let's really consider what truth is. What, what, what truth is it talking about? What proof or proving is it talking about? The excuses that we're making for our sins. God says, well, come, let's reason together about your sin, right? Is this really true what the devil's telling you? Well, it's not so bad because nobody else knows about it and it's not hurting anybody. God says, well, let's consider that. Let's reason together about that. Sin is deadly. Whether anybody else knows about it, whether we think it's a secret sin or whether it's a public sin, whether we rate it as a one or whether we rate it as a ten, God says it doesn't matter, right? It's sin. It's deadly. He says, come, let's reason together the truth about your sin. And when you come to the foot of the cross, you have to get to the heart of the matter about your sin, don't you? The truth. And that's what he's saying. Come by God's way of redemption. God's word, the Bible, will demonstrate what is right and true regarding the dark stain of sin in your life. While psychology and philosophy excuse it away. Which one are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to God's word? Or are you going to listen to the reasoning away of what God's word says by our culture, by society, by psychology and psychiatry and philosophy? God's redemption plan from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the only remedy for removing the dark stain of sin from your life. So no other reasoning will do. Amen. There is no other way. There is one way, and it's God's way. It's the way of the Bible. It's the way of God's redemption plan. It's the way of what Jesus was destined to do from the foundation of the world, which was to go to the cross in your place and in my place. You must come to the Lord and come by way of the cross, or your sin stains remain. Amen? You may, you may change your behavior and have better behavior, but you're still lost in your sins if you don't come God's way. Listen to this quote. All the humanistic psychology, psychoanalysis, group therapy, and secular counseling can't perform in a lifetime what Christ can do in a moment. Amen. Do you remember when you got saved? What Jesus did in a moment undid years of corruption and sin and the consequences of sin. Amen. And you felt clean. Amen. You felt refreshed. 
Jesus did it in a moment. The church must get back to the altar and hence to Christ. Repentance is an ugly business, even though producing a glad and glorious result. The modern church wants to tell you you don't have to repent. Why do they do that? Because they don't want the ugly business of repentance in their church. It hurts their reputation. You know what? It doesn't hurt God's reputation. Because he can take the ugliness of our repentance, no matter how bad our sin is, the ugliness, the dark stain of sin. You haven't gone too far. You haven't done too much. Jesus says, bring it to me. Come now. Let's reason together. I'm not ashamed to have you sit in my lap and let's fix this, even though the modern church might be. But let's repent. Amen. Let's do a 180 degree turn. Let's stop going this way and let's run back to my ways. Amen. That's what God is saying. And we need to get to a place where we're coming, not hesitating, coming now and reasoning with the Lord by what his word says, by what the spirit of truth is saying in our life uh, regarding our sin. Number two, three realities concerning the dark state of sin. We must come and reason with the Lord. Number two, our present condition doesn't have to be our future. Can you say hallelujah? Amen. He does it. Our, our past condition or how we are presently even, if there's sin in our life, it doesn't have to be our future. But doesn't the devil tell us just the opposite? Oh, you'll never change. Look at you. Look at yourself. You're, a, you're, a, you're an idiot. God doesn't want you in his family. He doesn't want you to try and live for him. You've made too many mistakes. You've gone too far. It says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The devil tells you, you can't change this dark stain of sin. It's just who you are, right? Have you ever had the devil tell you that? You're just going to have to learn to live with it. It's how you were born. Or he tells you, you've gone too far, you've done too much, you've sinned too deeply, that even God won't forgive you and fix this mess that you've created. But that's a lie of the enemy. Your present and your past doesn't have to be your future. If you understand what Isaiah 118 is talking about for our present sin stained condition to not be our future, we have to take ownership of our sin. Amen. A lot of people are living in denial again, making excuses or justifying or comparing their sin with others. You've got to stop that. If your future is going to change, you have to take ownership. You have to acknowledge your sin before God. It's not your dad's fault. Amen. Don't we hear that too much? It's not because of your environment. You were raised poor. You were raised in the inner city. You were raised without the privileges that other people have. And that's why you act the way you do. That's not taking ownership and acknowledging your sin. That's making excuses. And God can't change your future if you won't acknowledge your present or your past. Amen. There's some truth in that. And we need to get a hold of that. David demonstrated biblical repentance that God recognizes in Psalm 51. We sang about it this morning. Look at Psalm 51, verses 1 through 7. And notice some things in David's prayer. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Amen? It's not my dad's fault. It's not my environment's fault. God, it's my fault. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge. Do you see that? I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. I'm not trying to hide it with fig leaves like Adam and Eve. I'm not trying to shove it under the rug and make excuses for it. God is right here. It's ugly. And God, I don't want to live with it anymore. You've got to help it. Help me change this act of sin in my life or this lifestyle of sin. God can change both. Amen. As a believer, we shouldn't be living in a lifestyle of sin. But sometimes there's acts of sin that we're tempted with because we still have a sin nature until we get before God in heaven. Right. But we should be living controlled by the sinful nature if we're believers. But sometimes the devil tries to resurrect that old sinful nature, doesn't he? With acts of sin. Either one God can take care of if we'll do like David and acknowledge him. He says, my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned. Every sin that we commit is against God first. It often affects other people, but it's against God first. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity 
And in sin, my mother conceived me. That's talking about our sin nature. We all have a sin nature that has to be dealt with. And when we get saved, it's dealt with. God cuts the cord. And that says, that's no longer your master. I am your master. But we can reconnect the cord and plug it back in, can't we? In our willful stubbornness and rebellion, if we're not careful. And God says, he's telling us about that sinful nature. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. You will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. David understood acknowledging his sin, biblical repentance. And if we don't go by the same way David did, we can't be cleansed from our sins. Amen. God wants to cleanse us from every act of sin. He wants to break the power, the dominion, the grip of the sin nature that you're born into because of Adam and Eve and the fall. He wants to break that power over your life, but you've got to come God's way. The promise and consolation of this verse, Isaiah 118, can only be claimed by those who obey verses 16 and 17. Let's look at those two verses. Isaiah verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. This is God speaking. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Those are all things that you can't do by willpower, right? Or determination. They're all things that could only flow from your life naturally after God has changed your heart, right? We can't cleanse ourselves. We have to run to God and say, God, I need you to cleanse me. But once our heart is given to Jesus, we can do all these things that verse 16 and 17 tells us. So it's not about religion. It's not about wheels in motion and works, works, works. It's about yielding ourselves to God and his redemption plan and allowing him to bring about this work of the spirit in our lives. Sin is like a woodpecker. I think we have a picture of that. We have those around here. I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Sin is like a woodpecker. Each particular attack makes noise, but doesn't seem to do much damage. But like a woodpecker, if you let it chip away at your life long enough, it will leave many an ugly hole that never fills in. The church that I worked at before uh, we started Finished Work Worship Center, they had just stucco the building. And the adhesive that they used to, it was a metallic building. The whole building was metal, you know, sheets of metal. And then they, they uh, put foam on it and, and stuccoed it to make it look uh, less like a barn, right? And, and more like a real building. And uh, the, the adhesive that they used in the corners of the stucco and to hold the stucco to the metallic building and the foam uh, is, a, is a product that has sugar like molasses in it. And woodpeckers love it. <laughs> we found out. There is another kind that's more petroleum based, but it's not as friendly to the environment. So a lot of companies don't have gotten away from the petroleum based and they've gone with this molasses based. But they didn't realize woodpeckers love this. So we had this woodpecker right outside one of the office windows and it would and you'd hear this and it would hit that metal of the metallic building and the whole building would vibrate. <laughs> and so we're like, where, what is that noise? It took us a while to figure out what it was. And it was one of these. We went outside the window and if you just ignore it, they find that, that adhesive and they start telling their friends, you know, it's like ants at a picnic. And we had woodpeckers coming and trying to get into that adhesive stuff. I think they eventually had to put some petroleum based over the other because the woodpeckers kept coming and we'd kill one of them and there'd be three more show up. So woodpeckers are a good picture of sin. If we ignore the damage that is going on because of sin in our life, we're going to find gaping holes in our spirit. Amen. Gaping holes in our emotions. We're going to see even our physical lives affected by ignoring our sin. And we don't want that to happen. Scarlet or crimson was the color of a deep red permanent dye. And its deep stain was virtually impossible to remove from clothing. The stain of sin seems equally permanent, but God can remove sin stains from our lives as he promised to do for the Israelites here in Isaiah chapter one. We don't have to go through life permanently soiled. God's word assures us that if we are willing and obedient, Christ will forgive and remove our most indelible stains. Amen. If you've seen like medieval times or a movie where they have medieval times depicted in the movie, if they dyed a garment purple, a deep purple or a crimson red, it was irreversible. And that's what God is giving us a picture of in this verse. Your sin will stain you permanently. 
if you don't come to Christ and allow him to cleanse it from your life. Your present condition may be the dark, scarlet stain of sin, but your future can be as white as snow by way of Jesus and the cross. That's what God is telling us today. Your present condition may be the crimson red, seemingly irreversible stain of a life of rebellion and disobedience, but your future through Jesus, it is finished work at Calvary. On the cross, it can be as white as wool. God can take the stain away if you'll trust him, if you'll believe him and what he did at the cross, and if you will allow him to. Amen? If we'll come by faith. Number three this morning. Three realities that God wants us to see regarding the dark stain of sin. Number three, the Lord alone can cleanse the dark stain of sin from your life. Your goals, as noble as they may be, will never cleanse sin from your life. Your determination, no matter how strong you may think it is, will never cleanse that dark stain of, of disobedience, of rebellion and sin from your heart. Your good deeds, no matter how many of them you may engage in throughout the rest of your life, could ever offset the horrible dark stain and darkness of sin. Only Jesus can cleanse you. Amen? Only Jesus can cleanse you. This glorious passage illustrates to us the eternal truth that irrespective of the evil, wickedness, deception, and weight of sin, He stands ready upon proper confession and proper repentance to forgive all and thereby to cleanse all. Consequently, man has no excuse. There is a remedy. Amen? There is a cure for the dark stain of sin. But there's only one. Amen? There's not many. All roads don't lead to Rome. There's only one that can cleanse from sin, and that's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When we're in a state of sin, it's like riding a bicycle into the wind. Look at this picture. Have you ever done that? I know uh, Brian Henningsen, he likes to go cycling. I'm, I'm sure in Colorado you face this. But it's no fun to ride a bicycle into the wind, is it? You really have to learn. You learn about drafting really quick if you have to do that. God appears to be against us when we're riding against the wind. Yet like the bicyclist who turns around and finds that the wind is helping him, if we repent and change the direction of our lives, we will find that God is working with us. God didn't change. We did. Amen. We stopped riding against the wind and we figured out, oh yeah, it would be a whole lot better if the wind was at our back. Amen. If we're going God's way. And that's what repentance is all about. Stop resisting God's plan for your life, which is holiness and purity and Christ's righteousness and allow the flow of, your, of the Holy Spirit to, to change you, amen? To make you a little bit more like Jesus. The Lord alone can cleanse the dark stain of sin from your life and we need to allow Him to do that. Would you stand with me this morning? I want us to close in a time of prayer, response to God. Every time God speaks, amen, He wants an answer from us. What's the response that God wants from your life today? Is there willful sin in your life? Things that you know the Bible says you ought not to be doing, but you're doing them anyway. Maybe nobody else knows about that, but God does. Amen? He sees. We can't hide it from Him. We need to give that to the Lord. Maybe there's sins of ignorance. All of us this morning should say, God, if there's anything in my life, search me, O oh God, as David said, and see if there be some wicked way in me, some twisted, that's what the word wicked means, Something that's the truth, but that's been twisted. God, something I'm manipulating for my own benefit. But God, that as your Holy Spirit puts his finger on it, God, I'm going to see. I didn't know about it, but now I do. God, I don't want to have that hard attitude. God, I don't want to have that wrong way of thinking. Does that make sense? Sins of ignorance or sins of omission. Maybe there's something God's told you to do. Witness to that coworker, or go meet a practical need of a neighbor and you haven't done it yet and the Lord keeps putting it upon your heart and you keep putting it off. Amen? We all do that. We all do that. It's the ugliness of sin. But it's a sin of omission. Uh, James 4.17 To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Are we doing all that God wants us to do? And as a church, you know, God cannot bless finished work worship center unless we're walking in righteousness and true holiness. Amen? We can't see these chairs filled unless we're living in righteousness and holiness. Why? God's not going to bless us so that we can squander the blessing. Amen? 
He's going to bless us because we're doing what he wants us to be doing. Amen. Preaching the message of the cross, reaching lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, ministering to hurting, broken Christians. Some who have even been hurt in church. If that's our heart's desire, God says, yes, I want to bless you. But if you just want something because you want it. Amen. Because we're spoiled. And sometimes we do that. God's not going to bless us because of that. He's going to bless us because we don't, we don't want anything sinful in our lives. We want what is righteous and pure and holy. Does that make sense? That's what it's talking about when it says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you. And so if there's some area that you need to repent of today, you know, you don't have to tell me what it is. You need to tell Jesus Christ, your advocate with the Father, what it is today. Say what he is saying. That's what confession is. Confession isn't coming to your pastor or to a priest in a little booth with a curtain. Confession is saying with God what he says about that sin in your life. And he says it's wrong. He says you need to repent of it. He says though your sins are as scarlet, they can be white as snow. Amen. And so if you will let him have that this morning. He wants to bring a change. I, I want us to consider this this morning. If you're listening to this message, maybe you're listening to our YouTube or our audio channel this morning, and you've never given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that the dark stain of sin is hanging and looming over your life, and you, can, you don't know how to get free of it. You didn't know how to get free of it until you heard this message this morning. Well, Jesus has made a way, amen? Jesus is the remedy for the dark stain of sin in your life, and if if you believe who Jesus is and you believe what he did for you at Calvary and you just say what God is saying about your sin in your life today, he can forgive you. Amen. He can cleanse you. He can give you a fresh start and you can be saved and have a no soul salvation. You're ready for heaven because you give your heart to Jesus. Amen. Sin no longer has to be your master. Jesus Christ can be your master and you can get a Bible and live According to God's word, you can do what is righteous because God will help you by his Holy Spirit. And so if that's where you're at this morning, you either need to give your heart to Jesus for the first time. Or maybe you once knew the Lord and you need to get things right with him. You need to rededicate your heart. I want us to pray this prayer this morning. And I want to invite you to pray this prayer wherever you're at. Pray it out loud. Pray it to the Lord and invite Jesus to come in and cleanse that dark stain of sin from your life. Amen. I want those that are here this morning to help me with this prayer. And let's pray this prayer. And if you need to give your heart to Jesus, pray it in faith and allow the Lord to do a work in your heart this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, admitting and acknowledging that I am a sinner. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins, paying the penalty that I deserved. And I am in need of you, Jesus, to be my Savior to be my Lord. Please forgive me for all my sin. Wash me, make me clean, and help me from this day forward to live for you. Thank you for saving me, making me ready for heaven. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you made that decision, give us a call, send us an email, let us know. We want to encourage you and help you in your walk with the Lord. The best decision you've ever made, the weight of sin has been lifted off of you. Amen. And you can be free to be the man or the woman that God wants you to be and live according to his word. Amen. Live empowered and helped by his Holy Spirit. That's what started today. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or you rededicated your heart to Jesus. I want us this morning, we're going to sing a couple of songs and close in prayer for us as believers. Because we're believers doesn't mean we're sinlessly perfect. Amen. Some of us, even this past week, we had some acts of sin. We're not controlled by a lifestyle of sin, as we said before, but acts of sin creep into our lives. And if we ignore them, what happens? They can become a lifestyle again. And Jesus can be dethroned from our life and sin can be our master again. So if there's some things in your life, whether it's willful sin, sins of ignorance, sins of omission, can we, as we sing these songs, can we say, God, search my heart, purify me. I want to be holy and pure and clothed in Christ's righteousness, God, so that I'm a perfect candidate for your blessings. Amen? And maybe you have a need this morning. That need can't be met if there's impurity, if there's flesh in control in your life. And so as we sing these couple of songs, 
Let's let the Lord do a work of his Holy Spirit in our hearts. Amen. We can lift our hands in worship and just give him what's going on in our life. Maybe nobody else knows what's going on. They don't have to. But confess to Jesus what's going on and let him cleanse you this morning. Amen.
But he was, sent, he was a man after God's own heart because he was quick to repent. Amen? As soon as the Holy Spirit would, would prick David's heart, would, would drop it into his spirit that he had done something that didn't glorify God, God, David said, God, forgive me. God, cleanse me of my sin. Not somebody else's fault, but, but what I did wrong. And let's ask the Lord to give us that kind of heart as well. Amen? A heart that's quick to repent. And I believe the Lord's going to bless this church. Amen. He's going to continue the work that he started in us. If we'll have a heart for purity and righteousness and true holiness. Amen. This needs to be a holiness church. Amen. Where we reverence and we respect the purity and the awesome righteousness and holiness of the Lord. And when we do that, God will continue to show up. Amen. And to show out. Let's believe the Lord for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, today for your word. Lord, I pray that we'll take to heart what Isaiah 118 says about the dark stain of sin. And Lord, if there's anything in our lives that are not pleasing to you, God, whether it's a willful sin, a sin of ignorance, or a sin of omission, God, I pray you'd cleanse our hearts from every sin stain this morning. God, give us holiness. God, give us uh, Christ's righteousness. God, give us a purity. God, you said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Lord, we want to see you. We want you to show up here at Finished Work Worship Center. God, we want you to show up in Colorado Springs. God, let us see that the way to have that happen is to have our sins forgiven, to have our hearts right with you. Lord, let us be quick to repent like David, to acknowledge our sins, to acknowledge our disobedience and our rebellion when it happens. And God, to keep you as a master over everything in our lives. Lord, that's our heart's desire this morning. Lord, cleanse us, purify us. Lord, give us a heart for our lost loved ones who are weighted down by sin physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And God, move us with compassion to tell them the good news, to tell them God's redemption plan, to tell them, Jesus, that you are the only remedy for those dark stains of sin in their life. God, let us see a harvest of souls brought into the kingdom. Lord, right here in Colorado Springs, among our loved ones, among our family members that are lost, Lord, we just believe you to do that. Lord, I pray that you will just anoint us and use us. Give us opportunities even this week to be instruments, tools in your hand that you can flow through to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We just still believe it's the power of God unto salvation. We just pray that you'll give us divine appointments. Use us to do that this week. Bless us as we leave this place this morning. Help us to meditate upon what you've shown us in this message today throughout the week in our own prayer time. God, uh, accomplish your will. Uh, Lord, confirm your word with signs and wonders and miracles and mighty deeds. And we'll believe you for it. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah.